Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me in the Linda Hall Library. You know, this is quite a, an honor, I feel, to, to come in such a beautiful building. It's amazing. Um, you know, we don't have this kind of facilities in San Francisco. Um, <clears throat> now, it's really my pleasure. Um, I'm going to try to tell you a little bit I mean, it's, it's, we, we could spend hours talking about this topic. We, I was already downstairs uh, at the reception talking to quite a number of people. And there's a lot of questions that come up when you think about, you know, how will cars drive themselves on the highways and on our roads in our urban environment? And the title said, I, I took the title that, uh, that Eric gave me, you know, the future is now self-driving driving vehicles are a reality. That is not the normal title I use for my talk. So I have a, a but. <laughs> you know. But what does it mean to develop what I call socially acceptable urban self-driving? Because I think we can all understand that we're excited about new technology and new technology changing our world. But we should not forget that technology is always in service and in purpose for humans, for people. And that, I think, technologists, roboticists, AI people who are developing this should never forget. And that's why I coined this term, socially acceptable. Because what is it to have a robot that is not socially acceptable by people and is built by people for people? We don't want these kind of systems. And so that's why, you know, my, this year I have this, this topic of socially acceptable. Next year I will have another topic. As you, as you might have heard, you know, Nissan will be at CES uh, in January. Uh, the CEO will have a keynote. I will be on stage with the CEO and we will announce some new technology, which I'm not allowed to talk about tonight. But so you will have to invite me back next year. <laughs> and I will talk about that. <clears throat> Okay, so before I start, let me explain to you a little bit about Silicon Valley. I mean, I don't know, I'm in, you know, the middle of the country. I've never been uh, to Kansas City. So I thought, you know, let me start with saying a little bit about where we are in Silicon Valley. So Silicon Valley used to be like somewhere, somewhere here where Intel and, you know, um, the technology craze started in the United States. Um, but now Silicon Valley covers almost the entire Bay Area. Um, and so I, I showed here when, where my research center is. It's right at the, at the edge, at the bottom of uh, the Bay. Um, it's in Sunnyvale, California. And what is this ecosystem? Why is Silicon Valley so dominant in, in the creation of technology? Um, one of the reasons is that we have universities, right? Some of the best universities in the world are in Silicon Valley. Of course, everybody knows Stanford, everybody knows Berkeley, but people forget that UCSF is one of the largest and one of the most uh, innovative medical schools uh, in, in the world. And so we have both technology from computer science, but also medical and biology and bio, biochemistry. We also have national laboratories. We have Stanford's uh, SLAC. We have Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. We have Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And we have NASA. And this is where, you know, I don't know how many people know, but this is where the, the, the technology about autonomous systems started. You know, when I came there in the late 90s, we had the first deep space um, spacecraft that flew autonomous. For about two hours, it was controlled autonomous by a system developed by my colleagues and myself at, at NASA. Um, a lot of this was done with the help of people from Carnegie Mellon University, right? The Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon University, those scientists helped NASA to develop autonomy uh, for space. It is therefore not strange that Stanford University became the first one to win the DARPA Grand Challenge by somebody who came from Carnegie Mellon University, Sebastian Thrun. It's not strange that the Google 
car project is, was run because he recently left by Chris Ermson. He graduated from the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon. It's not strange that the head of autonomy in my company, or in my center, is Liam Pedersen. He was um, actually ahead of Chris Ermson at, uh, uh, at the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. So you can see that this technology was really created by one of, one of the, the nation's most capable engineering schools. Um, of course, MIT played a role as well, but I, you know, it is clear that Carnegie Mellon University is where robotics, the Robotics Institute where is where this technology is coming from. We also have um, corporate research. I've worked at PARC, Palo Alto Research Center, uh, well known for uh, the development of the internet, well known for uh, Steve Jobs taking away their Windows systems to create Apple and become rich, uh, well known for uh, Adobe's uh, Postscript uh, that were also created at Park, but then they went outside and built their company Adobe, um, and also SRI. Um, SRI has played um, a, a major role in AI technology and robotics. Uh, way back in the 60s and 70s as well. And IBM also has one of his big research centers uh, in Silicon Valley. And then, of course, we have all the big companies that we know. Apple, Google, Facebook, Oracle, HP, Genentech, also medical companies. Kaiser Permanente, one of the largest medical companies uh, in, in, in the country. And then, recently, Uber... Twitter, and we can go on and on and on. And then we have venture capital, and it started on Sand Hill Road, right? But it's now going to uh, San Francisco and also to Oakland. Oakland is now the cheap city to go live in, in, in the Bay Area. And of course, Oakland is close to Berkeley. So it is not strange that the venture capitalists and the startups are moving to Oakland. Um, even Uber is moving to Oakland. And then we have these, uh, these new places uh, there are found for, for startups. You know, we have places like Y Combinator, places like Founderspace, places like 500 startups that incubate young entrepreneurs and create startups. And this is what this ecosystem is that creates startups in all these places around the Bay. And then, very recently, the motor companies, the automotive companies moved in. And this is now... Um, becoming a hotbed of the development of autonomous vehicles uh, in the world. Um, Baidu uh, is actually not an auto company. It's kind of like the Chinese Google. They're next door for me. Andrew Eng, who was the guy who created machine learning for Google and the Stanford professor, is now chief scientist of Baidu. He sits across the street from me. So all these people that create this new technology are all combined in this small area. And this is why everybody wants to come here, there, and everyone wants to be part of it. So, that's just to give you a background of what's going on. And if you drive around Silicon Valley uh, in Mountain View, um, you can find Google cars driving around. If you go a little further in San Francisco, you find Cruise driving around. All right? Cruise was bought by GM. You know, Lyft and Cruise are now creating this, uh, you know, kind of like the, uh, the competitors of Uber. Right? If you go and you see Uber cars, everybody is in Silicon Valley driving around. What we are doing is what I call the center of AI, of artificial intelligence, for Nissan. To do the research to develop autonomous systems and to develop autonomous cars. We do these three areas of research. But all these areas, especially connected car and human-machine interaction and interfaces, or HMI square as I call it, are in service of the autonomous vehicle. Right? So that's what we are uh, embarking on. We are not car makers in Silicon Valley. I didn't think about cars till three and a half years ago. You know, I was working on robots uh, at NASA, um, not thinking about vehicles. Um, so most of the people in my office are computer scientists, or roboticists with AI background, working on the software to create the autonomous vehicle. So here is Nissan's roadmap. 
We are already um, in Japan. We have launched. Uh, it's called Pro Pilot now, not Traffic Jam Pilot, but it is a vehicle that uh, can drive on the highway in lane, hands-free. By 2018, we will have a vehicle that um, will drive on the highway and can autonomously change lanes. Okay, and that is all I think expected. Everybody kind of seen the hype in the media, what we can do. Um, this is what I would call the easy part. It's the part that we all feel that is doable. You know, and the reason is we drive on a highway all in one direction. We have lanes. We all keep more or less within those lanes. We are more or less sane when we drive on the highway. And it is not a crazy thing. I won't expect mothers with children suddenly to cross the road or a soccer ball to come across the road and a child jumping after it, right? So that's okay. But then we talk about city driving in 2020 and that's a different ball game. And most of my talk tonight will be going about city driving because that is where I think the tough problems are, but also I think where we will have to go if we talk about self-driving cars and autonomous systems, you know, and people enjoying the benefits of this. I also want to say that for Nissan, and, and this is an important uh, distinction between some companies uh, and, and Nissan, or, and that is the, that we are saying our technology by 2020 is hands-free or hands-off, but eyes-on. The human is in the loop and is supposed to be watching what is going on. And I hope to explain to you why we're doing that. Why don't we say, okay, let's yank the steering wheel out of the car and the pedals and let the car do it and we just go and sleep in the back seat. And I will hope to explain to you why that is not yet, I think, um, something we should be trying. So let's go a little bit about what um, NHTSA and uh, SAE, you know, the engineer uh, society, has defined as levels of automation for autonomous driving. They talk about five levels. Um, you know, six, but level zero, there is no automation. Level five is full automation, as they're saying, and that means no steering wheel in the car, no brakes, no paddles, you sit, you sleep, and the car will do its job, right? No interaction by a driver. You know, between three and four, we are in this, this zone where the car can drive by itself, but not everywhere, not all the time. There are, issues, you know, there are still situations where we can't drive autonomously and a driver needs to take over. And then there is this partial automation. And this whole, you know, two and three area is kind of difficult because some people say, and I, I agree, we will, cars that drive at level two will be cars that are capable of driving at level three, but we won't let you take your eyes off the road, right? Because we have to have the ability for the human to always take over when something is not you know, kosher, when something goes wrong and the system can't handle it, okay? So, then you say, okay, what is the value of autonomous driving if you have these levels and at what, what point is it valuable for people to create or to have an autonomous vehicle? Or a vehicle can drive itself uh, at some times and not at other times and this is a very difficult topic. I mean, we could sit here for hours debating and we have opini opinions and, you know, it, it is not a science that we yet know. We, we can't just define yet, okay, this is the value for an autonomous vehicle. And why? Because we don't know yet what it feels like, what it means for society. We don't know yet how it will impact what we do and how we drive and, and all the other things. And I think the way Nissan looks at this is that we say we will build a base system for future services. We call that 83. 83 is our system that allows us to drive in the city autonomously. But 
it is not yet eyes off, right? So we call it still a level two type of capability because we still say you have to have your eyes on. And the definition of level two is that the human is still in the loop and the human is still in control. And that's why we say that capability is uh, level two. What we're trying to do by 2020 is to do city driving in that form. But then you can say, well, are you going to be able to do human-like driving? The way we drive, the way a human interprets the world and the way the human acts when something goes wrong in the world, are we really that sophisticated yet? And that's not something that we think we will manage by 2020. So what we're doing at the research center is we start and by the end of this year, we deliver this capability of what we call navigation drive, which means you can put in a waypoint like a navigation system. I want to go here and the car will come up with a route and drive the route. And when the car says, uh, maybe a little bit too difficult, it hands back over to you, you drive, and when it can do autonomously again, you can say, okay, now you drive again. So we, br we will deliver this capability at the end of this fiscal year for Nissan, which is around April. And then we continue researching to build a car that can drive more and more like a human. And for that, we need to do things like predicting behavior of other road users so that we can be socially acceptable. And I will explain to you more and show you video of what I mean with that. So this is one direction the research can go. The other direction is to go up. So some companies decide to not go to this level here, but to go up and say, well, no, we're going to build eyes off cars. We're going to build cars that you can, you know, read a book if you're driving, right? And so there is this trade-off between going broad or going deep. And for Nissan, the trade-off is first to go this way, right? And then to go this way. Eventually, we say, this base level of autonomy is used for, if you do talk about business to business kind of services, you know, car sharing, you know, robo taxis, robo delivery, shuttles, buses, you name it. But then on the other side, as a car company, we are pro preliminary selling to customers, right? Private citizens like ourselves. And so, um, what that would mean for people to own a driverless car or own a car that has capability like this is something that, you know, we are still learning what the value is for that. And I think by talking about it, by coming out and discussing and making people aware of the technology, uh, because most of this will be about acceptance of the, of the public, right? Whether this technology comes in five years or four years or in 20 years. And so this is why I think it's important to give these kind of talks, like tonight. So let me go a little bit technical. I don't want to go too technical, but uh, I heard that, uh, you know, in a science library, there are people that are probably engineers and scientists uh, in the audience and are very intrigued about how do we make these cars autonomous. This is a high-level diagram, a software architecture diagram of what constitutes the software for an autonomous vehicle. And I could go a little bit simpler, and I could say any autonomous system, whether it's Siri, whether it's uh, Amazon Echo, whether it's my agents in the cloud for healthcare, for monitoring patients at home, it is about sensing the environment, decision making, or AI, and controlling something in the environment. In a case of a car, it is sensing the road, sensing the people, sensing other cars, sensing traffic lights. And at the end here, it's about steering, you know, accelerating, braking, turning on the signal. That's what the control is about. And in between, we have to create what we have between our heads between our ears, sorry, which is the AI. And the first thing we need to do when sensing comes in, when we use a LIDAR, which is a light radar, 
right? We send light waves out and it bounces back and we get points in 3D space. X, Y, Z points. And from that, we can maybe measure distance. And so if you put all those points, if it goes you know, over my computer, it comes up and the points hit the computer, come back, and I will have a service. I see a square or a rectangle, right, that I can identify. And that's great. That can happen in the sensing. But that's not perception. Perception is what we do to say, oh, that's a computer screen. Oh, this is a water bottle, and it's full. Oh, that's a chair. This is a table, right? That's perception. So knowing what you're looking at, knowing and understanding what it is that you're seeing, is what happens in perception. Once you have, you know, it, it, you have understood what you see in the world, you create what we, what we call a world model. A world model is all the objects that we can see around the world, in the world that we can observe, has a meaning, we know what it is, we know what direction it's going, what speed it's going, we maybe predict what it's going to do in the next five seconds, and that all resides in the computer memory in the world model. The a priori information is our maps. We need to have information about the lanes. If I take a left-hand turn, I need to know what lane on the other side can I go into, right? That's not information that is in Google Maps today. So we need special kinds of maps that don't exist today, that other companies will have to build for us. And if we don't have a map, we can't drive there. The ego state is about me, about the car. The knowledge that the car has about itself, the state, the location of the car, exact location of the car. This is a very difficult problem in the city, right? You all know that you're looking at your cell phone and you walk in Manhattan with the big skyscrapers and suddenly your cell phone says that you're two blocks on the other side and you're like, wait a second, no, that's not right because GPS does not work in the city, right? So we can't use GPS to localize ourselves in the city. And we need, you, I mean, you can imagine yourself, if you're driving on a, on a lane that's about this wide, if you are a meter off, right, I'm, I'm suddenly in the other lane. That's a dangerous proposition, right? If you're on a highway, 10 centimeters is actually, it's a lot. So we say we have to be at least five centimeter accurate to know exactly where we are. And I can tell you, it's very difficult if you don't have any other information than GPS to figure it out. So in an intersection, how do I know where I am in the intersection? How do I know that I'm not on a little bit too far to the right or too far to the left? Right? These are difficult things to figure out. And then the decision making. The decision making is where we decide what to do when we know where we are, where we need to go, and all the other objects around us. And let me show you a little bit more in detail what the decision making module is about. So here is the other side, right? We have here the sensors and the perception. It detects all the objects. Here we have the maps and the world model. And then here we have the decision making. And the decision making consists at high level in three modules. We call it the route planner, we call it the behavior executive, and we call it the path planner. And basically what goes on is that the system needs to say, I want to go from San Francisco to Sunnyvale. Let me find out a route that I can drive. Right, which is normally what navigation kind of does also. But now we need one step further. We need to say, well, what lanes? Let me see if this works. What lanes do I need to, can I drive in? Okay? So I need to know, okay, can I go from this lane to that lane? Where do I need to take a left-hand turn? If I take a left-hand turn, what other lane do I need to go in? So that's what the route planner does. It creates what we call a lane-level route plan. That goes down to the behavior executive. The behavior executive says now, okay, what are the goals that I need to come up with in order to drive down this road? And it creates these intermediary go uh, goals to go, and it also sees all the objects around it. So it can know, oh, if there's a car here, I can't go to this lane, so I should stay in this lane, right? So that's what the behavior executive constantly is trying to figure out every 100 milliseconds, right? And then we have, on a lower level, the path planner, because that's not enough. We need to know every three seconds what is the exact curvature of the car. How do I need to steer, right? If I need to make a, a change from a lane from here, do I go hop like this, or do I go smooth and go like this, right? And these are different and very difficult planning problems. 
So this is how we solve it. We solve it in a hierarchical manner. And the behavioral executive is constantly checking the objects that it sees, just like you as a human, you know, looking around and seeing and deciding if you, if you should take the left-hand turn or should just, oh, no, there's now a car, let me go straight. And I'll take, make a U-turn and come back. These are the kind of decisions that are made at this level. So I won't go any more detail. We can go very, you know, in very much more detail, but I'll leave it here. But it should at least give you kind of an idea how the software constantly tries to do this. So let me show you a little bit video. Here is our vehicle driving, and it's doing uh, a four-way stop negotiation. It knows that this bus has been there first, but it knows that this car came later, and so it can go before. And here you see it making decisions. You see that it also saw this car coming. And so the car can decide, right? What does it see in its environment? Am I there first? You know, who's on first? What's on second, right? And you can imagine this can get very much fun, how to do this. And I'll get back to you how difficult four-way stop intersections are. I now say the person who created four-way stop intersections should be in jail. <laughs> <laughs> it is a... Not a very safe kind of way to negotiate traffic. And so now we're, you know, we're laughing about four-way stop intersection, but if you look at urban driving, right, which is what I call any time that you exit the highway, you enter urban driving. So when we talk city driving, you know, everybody thinks about this already. Main Street, downtown San Francisco, uh, downtown Palo Alto, downtown Kansas City. Right, where you have bicyclists and pedestrians and trees and parked cars on the road. Craziness happening, you know, in San Francisco uh, at the Giants ballpark when the Giants are playing, you know, it's, uh, it's mayhem, right? Um, but no, we can start easier at arterial roads where it kind of looks like a highway, where we might have intersections but are with traffic lights, right? And traffic lights, intersections, are a lot easier because they're controlled. If people at least behave as they're supposed to behave. If they don't drive through red, right, that would, that would be good. So as you go up the, the more complexity, like residential street, where you start having parked cars, you start having uh, garage exits, uh, people walking, etc., bumps, speed bumps, um, the complexity of interactions go up. And when complexity of interactions with outside road users go up, it becomes harder to drive, right? So it is likely that autonomous vehicles driving in the city will start in areas where it's easier to drive, and we won't start driving here. Now, this is kind of interesting, because if you look at Uber and Google, they drive here. <laughs> they start here, because their model is completely different. Right? What they're trying to do is something completely different. They're trying to create a service to shuttle people around. Right? And that, of course, should be in the city. Right? But it is a very difficult problem that they're trying to solve right away. And let me explain to you a little bit why. Right? Let me sh talk a little bit about the challenges. So challenging situations, intersections, turns on red, what we call them, this is, I don't call this the monster. This is an intersection in Sunnyvale, down the road from my center, that the city of Sunnyvale has dubbed the monster. There's five traffic lights, there's a highway overpass, or, or you see here a bicyclist, uh, people coming from the highway here that want to go here on this road that goes to NASA. Google is now here. Um, it is insane, I can tell you. There are, humans can't negotiate this. <laughs> And then, of course, the four-way stop. So what we have, we have obeying traffic rules, right? Bar none, we have to obey the traffic rules. We have to perceive other road users. We have to localize, I already talked about that. And right on, turn on red seems like a, an obvious thing. By the way, that doesn't happen in, the U, uh, in, in Europe or in Japan, it's only a US thing. But to do this, we have to perceive high-speed cross-traffic with enough safety. I have to look here to the left in order to make this right-hand turn. Right? If there is a tree here, I can't look far enough down the left. If my sensors can't look far enough down the left, I can't make this right turn. So it seems like an easy thing to do, but for an autonomous vehicle, it's actually very, very difficult. And we say, if we can't do this with 100% certainty, 
it might be better not to provide that capability because that's dangerous if sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work right these are the kind of questions that and you know and issues that we try to decide what do we put into the capability of the car if i can say oh you know uh, on this intersection sure we can do it on that intersection no 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 how do you as a uh, as a consumer know which intersection you can do it which intersection you know that doesn't make any sense right so it's better to say if we can't do it everywhere let's not give it the capability we have to perceive multiple road users in the compact environment and as i already said we have to follow socially acceptable track patterns and practices and communicate with other road users and this i want to go in a little bit further to show you how incredibly complex this is but before there that let's show some other normal urban situations i don't know how it is in kansas city although i came from the airport and of course on the bridge you know we have construction so this is not easy you know um how do we know if the car should go this way or this way, right? Should the car go here or should the car go here? What if the map doesn't show that this is a new road? How does, you know? So you can see that these are, are problems that happen all the time. And how are we dealing with this? And then we have this. <laughs> right? I like this guy. <laughs> See, I mean, uh, you know, I, I would love this guy in my neighborhood. Um, but this person, you know, he's, he's pointing, right? He's telling me something. And what you won't know is maybe you can see that this is a green light. Maybe my sensor, even though this sun is completely blocking everything, maybe they can pick out this green light. I think we can do it. What we can't do, what you probably won't even see, is that there's actually a police officer standing there directing traffic. And you can see that by his legs that give a, you know, uh, you know, the sun is shining and his shadow is, is there. These are things that are incredibly difficult, right? So, this is then the question that I will pose. Is it really possible to have completely self-driving cars anytime soon? And I think the answer is uh, in some situations, maybe. But completely, it's going to take some time. And here are some reasons why. And I call this socially acceptable autonomous driving. Because driving <laughs> is a social interaction, right? We are the best autonomous systems that we know of bar some Martians, you know, somewhere in, in, you know, flying around in the galaxy. And we always communicate, do things together, and work not individually. And so the vehicle needs to do the same thing. We are social human beings. All our activity is social. Everything we do. We interact and communicate. We work as a team together. So there has to be this interdependence between vehicle and autonomous system and people. And this is for people inside the car, right? The car needs to understand what the people inside the car are doing, but also outside of the vehicle. The vehicle needs to understand what's going on in the world, and it needs to be smart enough to deal with that and communicate with the people on the other and outside. And so here, let me, let, me, let me try to stop this and, and replay it. I always do this. Um, let me start this again. Watch, I mean, first of all, watch these, this father with his kids. Drives on the wrong side of the road. Okay, that's normal. Here you see this pedestrian, and look at this car. In the meantime, look at these two people uh, fighting over who should go first. The car, just going now, she runs across the street. Right? Because she thought that he was going. Now watch these pedestrians here. She thinks that he's coming. And she pulls her husband back. And then in the meantime, he takes a left-hand turn, and he waves her on. And then she waves back. Now, this is 20 seconds. Right? A intersection in Silicon Valley in a small town. 
right? 20 seconds. There is no autonomous vehicle today that can, well, maybe this interaction between these two cars we can handle, right? And we would be very careful with the pedestrian and we will slow down. We definitely won't do what the car was doing, right? So we have to be very careful. That would make us very annoying, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, come on. We all, you know, eh, you know, come on. Yeah. Take, for instance, this pedestrian who is waiting at the intersection of... This is in San Francisco. San Francisco. She is standing with her weight on her back foot, her body oriented towards the crosswalk and near the edge of the street. She is simultaneously communicating, I want to cross, and thus, I am not going now. And because this is an intersection with light, she is also saying, I'm waiting for the light. So her positioning and her body language tell us not just what she is doing now, but also what she will do in the future. When the light changes, she does exactly what she projected she would. Through her movement and the direction of her motion, she is saying, I am going to cross. That was completely expected. But people don't always do what we expect. Consider the body language of these two women. At first, they seem on their way to cross the street. They even step into it. But then they stall. Their body language says that they are figuring out where to go. To other road users, they communicate, we are not going, so the car can go. So this is very interesting, right? This is, seems very normal. But can you imagine our autonomous vehicle figuring out that they're not going to cross? That is a very, very complex problem to solve. And there are no systems today that can do that, right? So what this car will do is it will just wait. And if these women then decide to suddenly go this way, the car will look like a fool and people will be getting upset. All right? And so these are hard problems that we're still dealing with in the research. Now let me go in something completely different. Because as a, Nissan is a worldwide car company. We plan to develop cars for everybody, everywhere, even in Iran, in Tehran. Now watch how people cross the road in Tehran. Crosswalk in Tehran, where car and motorcycle drivers don't stop for pedestrians, as would be the custom in the United States. Instead, all road users go whenever they can. Cars may slow down a little for a pedestrian and pass closely behind them even if it is a mother holding a child. Some pedestrians figure it is just as safe to cross the street elsewhere. The main rules both cars and pedestrians appear to adhere to is that the first one to occupy a space has the right to it. <laughs> Conflicts are settled by one of the road users slowing down so the other can proceed. Consider how this man starts to cross when there is a car right in front of him. He does indicate that he wants to cross and that he will go behind the car. He immediately steps forward behind the car, but there are two other cars in front of him. He slows his pace and momentarily looks the other way to indicate that the car can go ahead in front of him, which the car does, and the man crosses right after. At this self-organized crossing then, pedestrians, cars, and other road users constantly move to show that they are going to take the next spot in the order that they are going behind someone and in front of another. Just by communicating through movement, traffic flows in a tightly coordinated, self-organized fashion. In a few cases, road users do miscommunicate. Here is a pedestrian who slows down to let the motorcycle pass in front of it, just when the motorcycle adjusts its direction to pass behind the pedestrian. So the motorcycle has to brake and the man proceeds. The conflict is quick. So, I don't think we're going to drive there anytime soon. <laughs> or maybe it's easier. <laughs> you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's easier. All right, so, now this is far away, and people say, ah, oh, to you know, Middle East, uh, you know, mm, what about Amsterdam? <laughs> this is what I call coordinated chaos. In Amsterdam, and look, imagine that this is an autonomous vehicle, all right? By the way, in San Francisco, pedestrians rule. In Amsterdam, bicyclists rule. 
right? And nobody holds, you know, nobody keeps the law, right? It's all, it's, but it's coordinated. Everybody knows what everybody is doing. But to create a vehicle, you know, that, that is able to do this, <laughs> it's going to be a hard... So I hope I, you know, by these funny and actually mundane examples, these are very mundane examples, these are everyday examples, right? It's not that we picked a particular day to go there in Tehran or here in Amsterdam or in Mountain View, no, it's just any day. So what it's really about is to create what I call the rocket science of autonomy, it's about human-robot teamwork. How do we work together as systems and people? And there are things that people are good at and there are things that systems are good at. And we should use those advantages of both sides and create a system that can live together in a way that is acceptable for the human, right? Because it's because of us that we have autonomous vehicles. I always say, and I had these arguments with NASA all the time. I said, you know, you create this autonomous spacecraft and it goes away, and what then? It sometimes, somewhere, somehow needs to communicate with a human. Otherwise, it is a useless system. And I say, an autonomous system that does not communicate with people is a useless system. It doesn't have any purpose. And so that is what we need to understand. And this is why we need to create this open, heterogeneous system with people and robots. These are robots in the home, these are robots on our road, these are robots that fly, these are robots that drive trains, etc. This is how society will continue to develop, and we as scientists and engineers and roboticists need to be aware of this. And so, if you think about communicating what I call HMI squared, it is if we have the system here about communicating with the driver, communicating with the driver or the passenger when, the, when it's driving autonomously, communicating with the driver who is not paying attention once it can be completely autonomous, and communicating with the road users. And for that, we have this problem that people will have a model, you will have a kind of understanding of what the system is doing. Just like you have an understanding about the damn toaster who just doesn't toast my bread the right way, right? <laughs> it's set four, but it's not toasting, right? You will have a model of what this autonomous vehicle is doing. Why is it not going? Why is it standing here? You know, it can go, <laughs> right? At the same time, the autonomous vehicle needs to have a model of the driver needs to understand what the driver is doing. And on the same, at the same time, on the outside, right? The pedestrian has a model about what the car is doing, and the car needs to have a model about what the people are doing. And this is what I believe is the hard part about creating self-driving cars. And we really are just at the beginning. And one of the ways that we are trying to um, assess how we communicate is have a concept that we call the intention indicator, right? What we do as humans when we communicate, we communicate our intention to each other. That could be with signing, with waving you on. We are expressing what we are thinking we are seeing, our intention. And so we want to be able to communicate what the AV is doing. And these are concepts that we have been thinking about how to do that. One thing that we have found out is that it is not smart for the car to tell you what to do, right? Because if there's 10 of you, who am I telling what to do, right? So we have come up with the idea, it's like, no, we should always, so the car should always communicate its intention and let the outside people decide what that means, right? Now that's still not very easy to do. We have this concept, and this was uh, presented as a concept car at the Tokyo Motor Show, where there is this intention indicator with a light that shows and it moves with you, so you can see you know, that it's pointing at you, that it's seen you. And there is also a message display. Let me show you a little video. 
about this. So you see here the intention indicator showing the bicyclist and here the pedestrian also. Anyway, it's a short video, but it, it, it gets the concept across, right? Now, what is hard is to test this in the real world. We are not, not allowed to put these kind of lights on a car and test it on the road. You know, the government, the laws don't allow you to change the lighting on the car. So we have to get regulations changed and ask for permission to test this. And without testing it on the road, it's just a concept that we think might work, but we have no idea if people will actually look at it, pay attention, uh, like it, uh, and then you have the problem if Nissan does it with blue and lighting and Ford does it with a red light and we do it with a green light and you know blinking light now How do you know what is what so there needs to be regulation it needs to be you know These are things that uh, are just at the beginning, uh, but we all start communicating uh, Between each other so the the OEMs every two week two months I have a meeting with all the directors of all the researchers from the different OEMs in, in Silicon Valley and we discuss these kind of things to say, okay, what are the things that we need to understand together? Maps, these kind of, uh, you know, these communication problems. Um, you know, everybody has his own, you know, autonomous system. We don't go into detail about what we're doing, but to, to share information is what we need to do in order to make this a viable system. So I think, oh, well, I'll play it one more time. So, my last slide, I want you to, if there's one lesson for tonight, is that developing an autonomous vehicle is a multidisciplinary problem. Those um, videos that I showed you are created by people that are social scientists, anthropologists, sociologists that study how people behave. Okay? Of course, we have software engineers, we need roboticists, and we need AI. And together, I believe that we will solve this problem, but I don't think you have to, you know, you will see a self-driving car without a steering wheel on the road in Kansas City, you know, in, in the near future. It, it will take a couple of years. <laughs> All right. If you have questions, I'll come by with the microphone. We want to be sure to get the audio of your question, uh, not only for the people in the audience, but for our live stream viewers and for the video. I know there are some of these cars that are being tested as part of, I think, taxi cab fleets in Pittsburgh. And what I'm particularly interested in is the interaction between the, what the computer is going to do with the car and the ability of the computer to communicate who's the eyes behind the safety eyes behind the mechanism, behind the car, so that the individual has enough time to override what the car is going to do. How's that communication set up? Yeah, I, you know, I didn't have any slides on that. I mean, that, that is, um, that's a, a, a big problem because you have to make sure that the, the driver to take over is, you know, is able to take over, is not, you know, doing something else. Um, the concepts that um, you know at Nissan we're having is um, there. There are, of course, countdown clocks, right? So first of all, uh, the system will tell you it's going to take. You know, you need to take over in 15 seconds, and it will count down, right? And then it won't let you. It won't shut off the autonomous system until you really have the two hands on the steering wheel, right? So that is one way of of making sure that people are. Um, you know, contextual aware. And it takes a long time for people to become aware of their situation if they're not paying attention. And this is the hard part. Um, well, what if the computer is going to execute with the car something that's obviously dangerous? How much, what's the reaction time of the person to lose that? Well, so, yeah, so, so if the person is not taking over, you need to come to a safe stop. <laughs> and then, you know, 
so this is actually in, in the, D, the California DMV uh, regulations at the moment. The vehicle will have to come to a safe stop. And then the question is, what is a safe stop? <laughs> and that is then not defined. So if I'm driving 80 miles an hour on the Bay Bridge, a safe stop is something different than when I drive in my neighborhood. Um, and these are, you know, so we are working on what is a safe stop in what situation. And, you know, you can think of some, some situations is just pulling off to the road. Some situations is, you know, you can't pull off to the road, so you have to, you know, do something else. Maybe put on your blinkers, maybe slow down slowly and move, change lane. Um, you know, so these are, these are tough problems. In terms of sensing the environment, is it anticipated long term that the individual cars will be self-contained or will they be communicating in real time so they know about a situation even though before they're able to sense it themselves? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, the latter is more likely, right? Um, that we will have connectivity to some, some cloud that will update the maps in real time for the vehicle. Um, and if one vehicle has seen a problem, it might be able to communicate it to the other vehicle. Um, the, the issue with that is, though, that you can't rely on it, right? Just like we can't rely on vehicle-to-infrastructure communication or even vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. Because what, what do you do if it's not there, right? And, and so we have to build a system that can do it without those capabilities. So there will be a base map on the vehicle. Uh, the capability of driving in normal conditions will always be self-contained in the system. Um, but then you can update it if you have connectivity and you can be, you know, this is where I think we can go to higher capability by having, adding that kind of, uh, you know, of infrastructure. Um, but again, Nissan won't start there, right? We start with basic capability, we call this 83 where we hand over to you and we make sure that you are always, uh, you know, paying attention. Otherwise, um, you know, we have to include safe stops, right? If we can't make sure that you're not paying attention, then we can't, uh, and we cannot, then if you don't make the vehicle stop safely without creating accidents, then we can't release this to the public. It's too dangerous. And so this is where, you know, it's a very, difficult decision to make about what functionality do you add and what functionality leave, do you leave out because you're not sure that it's, it's safe. Um, and, and, you know, we're learning. I hope that helps. <laughs> Dr. Sirhaus, we have a question uh, back in the middle of the room here. Hi. Um, I was uh, just wondering, you showed us videos from Tehran and Amsterdam but even within the United States, there are vast differences in how someone drives. I've seen safe, smooth uh, transfers made on complex highway systems in California that I know would get someone killed in Missouri. Yep. You all cross five lanes of traffic without looking. It's weird. Uh, no yep. offense. Um, so how do you plan on helping the cars transfer from one socially acceptable schema to a different socially acceptable schema? Yeah, this is uh, it's a very good question. Um, when we started our research in this, um, you know, we, we had this idea, I mean, everybody understands that Tehran and the United States is different, right? You know, um, everybody even understands Amsterdam is different or Tokyo. Um, but then we started looking inside the United States and we, we kind of knew, you know, I lived in New York for 10 years. I kind of know that driving in New York is different than driving in San Francisco. Um, so we knew that the cultures are local. What we didn't know is how local cultures really are. <laughs> you know, it turns out if you go downtown Palo Alto, University Avenue in Palo Alto, uh, a third of a mile down the road is Stanford University. People behave completely different at Stanford University than downtown Palo Alto. So the, the, the difference in driving is incredibly local. And it is uh, a, big, a big issue how to deal with this socially acceptable uh, behavior in different cultures. Um, one thing that I have posed as a research question is to say, I believe there is a universal language that we use to communicate on the roads. 
And the reason why I believe that is that if you rent a car in Amsterdam, you might be scared, but you can drive, right? And you might be careful, but you will be able to get from one side to the other. Um, you might take a while before you understand certain behaviors, but you will get used to them and then you will adapt. And so that's what I hope that we can, we can do. We can teach the car this general language of how people communicate and interact. And then the car will have to learn by itself over time, just like humans do. And for that, we need to use machine learning capabilities and techniques. Um, this is where the previous question about if I can have a network connection to the cloud, if I switch from one culture to the next, maybe I can download my new language and uh, the car can learn that way. Dr. Steerhouse, uh, we actually have a question on Twitter. Uh, hashtag LHL Live, uh, at BH Gross wants to know, how does one determine legal responsibility for an accident involving self-driving cars? Somebody had to ask that question, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, the legal responsibility is on the person or the system that was wrong. And we have laws that determine, and we will have more sensor data than you want to have in order to determine who was wrong and who was right. So one of the things, the benefits of autonomous vehicles is that there won't be any question anymore who was wrong and who was right. Because I have gigabytes of data to show you who was wrong in what situations. And then it's just a matter of, you know, if the system was wrong, then whoever owns that system is probably liable unless we you know, give uh, the system uh, the responsibility and put the system in jail, but I, you know, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. We'll stay in the back of the room here. Yes, within the last few weeks, I saw an article someplace in the media indicating that the uh, California State Legislature was considering or maybe had already approved the uh, request from various car makers to take the steering wheel out of the vehicle. Do you have an update on that by any chance? Um, yeah, actually, NHTSA is, uh, you know, has, has uh, uh, defined, it's not a law, it's not a regulation, uh, it is a uh, document that they try to, you know, create and get communication with everybody that, that would, would allow that, uh, basically defining the driver as a system that, that drives, right? Um, and the California DMV is in indeed working on allowing that. And, you can imagine, you know, the, the reason is because there are uh, certain companies, right, that want to be able to, to test and try these kind of systems. And without the right regulation and laws, you know, that's impossible. And so to help the, the technology development to move on, um, you know, and this actually I think is a great, uh, a great thing. I mean, I, I actually, uh, you know, it, it's, it's quite a... Quite, quite amazing that, uh, you know, the government, the U.S. government and the local governments are really working and having an open discussion about how to make this possible. And everybody knows that we have to be safe, right? So, we, we, you know, that's number one, you have to be safe. But if you not allow it to happen, we can never create the technology. Like I'm saying with, the, you know, the communication of intent, if we are not allowed to change the vehicle based on the current code, then we cannot test these concepts and we will never be able to move forward. So, so I, I applaud this kind of, uh, you know, uh, communication between industry and government. Um, but I would say I also maintain that we have to be safe. We have to be very, very careful when we do, uh, you know, take the steering wheel out of the, out of the vehicle. I mean, that, and the way, you know, we're testing um, that's being tested now is there is always a safety driver and there is always a, 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 a system that can allow you to take over. So the, you know, the, in the Google, little Google car, there might not be a steering wheel, but there's, well, there is a joystick and the driver, the, the test driver can interact with the car. Yeah. Dr. Steerhouse, back here on your left. Hi. Uh, road fatalities are up enormously in the United States based on uh, 2015 data, first nine months, NHTSA reports up 9.3%. So I heard a lecture recently at the Missouri Road Safety 
conference a few weeks ago was a, um, uh, an Indian person who lived in Germany working for Mercedes-Benz and now is at the University of Alabama. The point of his presentation was that we already have enough um, uh, sensors and capabilities in automated features to make uh, crashes much less uh, certain um, on our roadways. And, and why isn't that the goal instead of creating a level four or level five uh, autonomous vehicle? Why aren't we instead equipping cars with those features so that the car will automatically break instead of hitting that pedestrian or that cyclist? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think you're, you're asking a, a very valid question. Uh, and I share your sentiment, actually. And I think Nissan shares your sentiment. And I, I think most OEMs, car makers, share that sentiment. And number one of creating this technology is for safety. Um, we call it the ADAS technology. And uh, a lot of vehicles are now coming on the market that have that technology. I mean, I myself have been driving uh, an Infinity vehicle with that technology for the last four years. Um, and I already say, you know, braking is a dumb activity for a human being. You know, the system can brake uh, better. Um, and um, I, I believe, you know, Nissan's uh, slogan, although it's a little bit, you know, futuristic, is zero emissions and zero fatalities. And that is why we're creating this technology. Um, you know, there's other companies that do it for other reasons. And I think, you know, the, the, the I know you can call it uh, a problem or you can call it uh, the benefit of, of technological advancement is that technology will always advance based on economic value and return on investment, right? That drives the creation of technology. Uh, I don't think, you know, the safety of humans, of other humans, uh, for some companies like the car companies, is a number one um, you know, reason for building this technology. But for other companies, that might not be its number one reason, right? It might be economic value in other ways. And so you will always have these two things in society that need to be balanced out. But I, I completely agree with you that, you know, that is why we should, uh, should do this. Um, I think that's also the reason why the, automotive, the automakers are not jumping right away with steering wheels out of the car. Right, because you know it, it's it's not to create self-driving cars; it's to create s safer cars and safer, um, you know, vehicles and less accidents. Dr. Steerhouse, I snuck up front uh, yeah. on yep. you here. Uh, due to the time, let's do three more questions, and uh, you're going to stick around for a few minutes. So, if sure. you, I know there are a lot of hands still up. So, if you want to ask a question, you can come up. He's yeah. on California time. So, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, no. it's only, I'll be awake it, for at least another three ten. hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a, a comment and, and a question. I guess the comment is, is I was thinking about your intersections and people seeing these cars doing things. And I remember every time you're driving along and you see a student driver notice on a car, but you notice that's a student driver, you better be a little careful, cautious watching them. Yep. And obviously, if all cars who are autonomous and there's not really a driver, at least at the wheel, has a green flashing light. I think most emergency vehicles are yellow, red, blue, or whatever. At least when you see a green flashing light on top of a car, you know there's no, there's no real driver in there, so you better watch it and give them away. Be careful because there's nobody in there to get mad at for doing something to you. Yeah. <laughs> but my, my question is that obviously all cars have to have insurance to be on the road. Yes. And so insurance companies play a big part of all this because they're going to have to assure these cars are, that are autonomous or fully autonomous. And so are you working with insurance companies or where does this all stand within the insurance industry as far as insuring the cars to be able to allow them to drive? So um, the answer is no. I mean, we're not working directly with insurance companies. I mean, we might talk to insurance companies that ask questions about the technology so they can get um, educated themselves. Well, um, obviously, in the insurance industry, this is uh, you know, a, a topic that is of concern, and they're thinking about how to deal with it. Um, I, I think that as long as the human is in the loop, 
right? If you have eyes on, as we call it, um, the driver is responsible. I mean, you know, you have to have a valid driver's license. You know, you are responsible for driving that car in autonomous mode, and you are responsible for making sure that uh, that there are no accidents. I think you know. So, it becomes a different question if it becomes driverless, and you know, you are not the one controlling the vehicle. And then you know, what those insurance models will look like, uh, you know, I I don't know yet. Um, I think that. Uh, companies will that own fleets of self-driving cars for whatever purpose might self-insure right so they don't have to deal with the insurance companies um, and new models of insurance will will come up um, you know as I said before it's like we might have a model where you, the insurance company says I will insure you for this part of your trip and it'll cost you 20 cents, yes or no, right? Um, and you say yes, and then you're insured, and if no, you know, and then, but if you say yes, then you have to obey by, you know, their laws and their regulations, and you're, you have to read the 100 insurance policy uh, <laughs> while you're driving, and <laughs> but I mean, I think that that's the kind of uh, changes that I will see happening. All right, Dr. Steerhouse, back here in the back on your right. Uh, you've identified uh, numerous technologies. Is there uh, a breakthrough that's required in any of these fields, or is it just a matter of iteration? And mm. in which one of these technologies is the greatest advancement required? Well, that's a great question. Uh, it's a very technical question. I, you know, I think um, there's a number of areas where breakthrough is required. You know, um, sensor technology is, of course, uh, the biggest problem that we're dealing with. And when I say sensor technology, it's like, if you, you, you know, if you remember the, you know, the particular scenarios of somebody waving somebody on, or, you know, knowing the, p the position of an individual standing on the side of the road. Right now, it's very hard to distinguish between a person standing still and a tree. It's not easy, <laughs> right? Um, and so moving objects are a lot easier than objects that are static. Um, and so sensors need to become better. This is where um, we know we're going for, uh, to camera-based solutions, where we use machine learning and deep learning to, you know, to solve this problem. But if, we, if deep learning could ever solve the dynamic problem of somebody waving on, right, uh, in, in a reasonable amount of time, the, 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 the amount of computing power that one might need to do that in real time, or in near real time, uh, is still such that we would have cars with, uh, you know, the, the back seat full of computers and cooling systems. You know, so, so, so that's where, you know, I think, uh, um, Technology needs to be improved, and of course, then you know what the stock, for, for cer certain companies that you know don't try to sell to the general public, um, you know, a sensor of forty thousand dollars might be fine, but I doubt that anybody here in this room is willing to pay, you know, the Tesla plus another sixty thousand dollars of sensors, and we're getting to two hundred thousand dollar car, right? Uh, just for you know this technology, that that I don't think is going to be doable. So we need to bring the price of the sensors down. And of course, if you bring price of sensors down, the quality will go down until we have this breakthrough capability. So that's one area. Um, the other area is maps, right? Uh, I can guarantee you driving with maps is not gonna be a long-term solution, <laughs> you know? And, and let me give you one hint, validation. How do I know that your map is correct? Right? So if I need a high definition map where I know where the stop, light, the stop line is, where the traffic signal is, right? where the lane is going to be exactly, right? um, that is, there's a lot of information in these maps. And if you deliver me one of those maps, how am I going to figure out that it's correct? 
The only way to figure out right now is to drive the map and then find out that it's wrong. <laughs> right? That is a big problem. So these are, these are tough uh, problems that we still need to deal with. All right, we have a question in the back on your left. And due to the time, this will have to be the last question. Thank you. Um, Nissan and other companies seem to be fairly open with their technology when it comes to electric cars and fuel cell cars. Um, is that same communication between automotive companies happening with self-driving cars? Uh, no, I, not yet, I would say. Not yet. It, it's still, you know, in research and development. Um, I think if you get to uh, this le the highway driving capabilities, uh, what I called 81, 82, I think we all kind of know what, what, is, what those systems can do and how those systems work. And the reason is, is that car companies use tier ones, right, to, to, to create uh, the technology, you know. So um, the sensors that we get, right, the cameras and the radar, and, you know, they all come from the same companies, right? So we all know what those capabilities are. And so we kind of can figure out, it's not that we're communicating our specs, but we kind of figure out, you know, through, oh, I know that this company uses the same sensors that we are using. Well, you know, then I kind of know what their capability is. Um, in terms of city driving, the AI systems that we're developing is still, you know, there are different approaches, um, there are different um, uh, levels of capabilities that you can, you know, if you see my car driving down the road, so for instance, our car, you won't see a sensor on the car. You would have to really look very, de uh, you know, clear because we have, you know, the car looks like a normal car. You might see, you might see cameras in the front that might give it away. Um, but if you see the Google car driving around, you know, or, or Uber, you know, it, it's kind of obvious, right? So, so there are different capabilities and different things, but how those systems exactly work, no, we're not communicating. Now, the one thing that gives it kind of away is that the people developing those systems come from the same universities, have been taught by the same professors. So you kind of know, right, what they know. <laughs> so this is how it works, yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Sierhaus, for the wonderful... And thank you for attending tonight's program. That's, that's a wrap for our fall public programming. So I hope to see you back in the spring. Join us uh, on Facebook, Twitter, and check us out at lindahall.org. Thank you and good night.